this is part four. Sorry, it's dragging out so long. Uh, so I'm going on to Brother Jackson's testimony. He's from the governing body, and this is his testimony testimony at the Australian Royal Commission held in July and August in 2015. And of particular interest to me is where he talks about elders being able to follow their conscience when it comes to reporting child sexual abuse. Hmm. Anyway, okay, I'll just get on and, and read the notes that I have here from the... Uh, I've got some quotes from the transcripts from the, the hearing. Okay, so uh, Angus Stewart, the head counsel for the commission, he asks Jackson about the matter of elders reporting to the authorities. And Jackson explains that elders have a spiritual dilemma. He says the scriptures do not authorise them to lord it over the victims and their guardians by reporting. So they, you know, they're saying they're not authorised by the scriptures. Elsewhere, I noticed uh, when an elder from one of the committee, uh, judicial committees was being um, interviewed, he stated that it was the, the victim's privilege to report. I thought, oh, okay, a privilege? Okay. Or uh, elsewhere, they just say it was their absolute right for the victims and it, to take over from that would be lording it over them. Okay. Um, but then he went on and said that if reporting was made mandatory, it would make this dilemma so much easier. So, is he saying that they will ignore the Bible after all and report? Hmm. But, in some states in Australia, there already is mandatory reporting. Uh, and it's, it still hasn't happened. So, uh, and he's saying if they do make it mandatory, then they would report. But they haven't been. Hmm. So, something's got to change there. So Jackson says that the elders should encourage the guardian of the child or whoever is in that family arrangement that is not the perpetrator to notify the authorities. And he says, I think the assumption is there that if any elder was to see that there was some definite risk, that their conscience should move them to do that, to report. So... This is still at odds with the Shepherd the Flock of God book, which says that if asked, if, there are, if, if victims or their guardians ask about reporting to the police, then they shouldn't be discouraged from reporting. But there's a, it's a passive thing. There's no actual encouragement, uh, no instruction in the manual to encourage the victim or the guardians to report to the police. Whereas here, Jackson is saying the elders should encourage the guardian to notify the authorities. So they need to put that into their new instructions. And I can't see that that's been done because they sent out a new letter uh, this year to replace the 2012 letter to the body of elders regarding um, how to handle sexual child sexual abuse allegations. And I can't see anything there about them actively encouraging and, and you know, arm-twisting the victim to report to the authorities. Um, anyway, so, Angus Stewart goes on to ask what happens when there is only one witness, that's the victim, and no confession from the alleged perpetrator. And he refers to literature which states that the matter cannot be taken further by the elders and it's left in the hands of Jehovah. Jackson replied that that is the case. However, that doesn't mean that they believe the accused is 100% squeaky clean, and he actually used those words, squeaky clean. He states, Our literature has said, and we agree, that in most cases with children with child abuse, they are telling the truth. That, that, that is an established thing. They're not making up these stories. So immediately, the elders would put into place protection measures to help, to make sure that the family cares for the child and that due steps are taken to protect the child. And 
because Christian principles indicate that if they realise a child is in a dangerous situation, action should be taken. Okay, so he talks there about protection measures being put into place and action being taken. The chair, so Justice McClellan, presses Jackson to explain what would be done to protect the child. Jackson says, well, for the ultimate protection of that child, I could, if they feel that child and other children are in danger, I can, well, I would hope that the consciences of the elders would notify the police if the parent is not willing to do that. Hmm. It makes me wonder what happened to the instruction not to lord it over the victims. So, okay, so here he's hoping that the elders would exercise their conscience and report. But it seems that that doesn't happen. Uh, Justice McClellan asks, So would you hope that the elders would act in that way? Is there any instruction that they are to act in that way? Then Jackson gives this dodgy reply. He says, You know, Your Honour, this is not my field. I can't tell you all the sections where we've said that, but that is my understanding. But if that instruction isn't given, that's perhaps something that we need to look at. Hmm. So, yeah, it's clear that that instruction isn't given. And I think that Brother Spinks would like to be able to tell the elders who phone him at the service desk to follow their conscience. But for some reason, uh, he's not been allowed to say that and as Jackson says here if that instruction isn't given that's something we need to look at so I don't think I saw anything about that in the new 2016 letter to the body of elders either anyway Angus Stewart asks uh, what if the girl the victim, says she doesn't want to go to the police but wants help from the church. What do you do? Jackson says spiritual help would be given. As an example, he quoted from the God's Love book, which he explains, there is a footnote there, tiny little footnote, that talks about secular action with regard to other witnesses. And there is a very clear footnote that says there, if someone does something like rape or a serious crime, Definitely, that should not stop a witness from reporting it to the authorities. So we would try to spiritually help them to become aware of their rights and the need, because mainly it is their decision. But if this affects other children, neighbours and so on, surely they need to think a little beyond just the one person. Hmm. So these are the immediate protective measures that are put into place by the elders. Okay can't see anything protective about that. Uh, okay, I just wanted to pull out the book, the God's Love book, and look at the footnote here. And it says, in this book, in rare instances, one Christian might commit a serious crime against another, such as rape, assault, murder, or major theft. In such cases, it would not be unchristian to report the matters to the authorities, hmm. even though doing so might result in a court case or a criminal trial. So it would not be unchristian to report the matter to the authorities. So it's put in a, rather than encouraging them to report to the authorities, it's this very passive kind of a statement. It would not be unchristian. It's like if, if the victim asks, only if they ask about reporting, telling them that it's their absolute right, rather than encouraging them to. So we're kind of getting a different story here from, from um, Brother Jackson. Uh, and I did notice on this subject uh, about, because this, where this footnote comes from in the God's Love Book, uh, it's talking about resolving disputes in business matters. So it's talking about brothers taking brothers to court. And we had just, there is just a recent watchtower. Uh, let me see if I've got it here. Uh, 
Um, oh, where is it? I am not as organised as I thought. It's the November 2016, or I might have made a note of it here. I'll, I'll put, oh, I've been holding on to it the whole time. <laughs> okay, this is the November 2016 Watchtower, and the article is Organised in Harmony with God's Word, and here it's talking about uh, but the subheading is, do you follow direction? What should members of branch committees or, or country committees, circuit overseers and congregation elders do when they receive direction from God's organisation today? Jehovah's own book directs all of us to be obedient and submissive. A critical or rebellious spirit has no place in God's organisation, for such an attitude could disrupt our loving, peaceful and united congregations. Etc, etc. Uh, then it, on the next page, it talks about taking your brother to court. Uh, and I mention this because some witnesses, I mean, witnesses have, have been conditioned not to take their brother or sister to court into the secular system um, because it would bring reproach upon the organisation and upon God's name. So there's that conditioning there that may prevent them from reporting even serious things like rape and child sexual abuse to the authorities. And we see this um, conditioning happening again in this uh, magazine article. It says here in paragraph 15, Some brothers were taking fellow believers to court. Paul asked them a sobering question. Why not rather let yourselves be wronged? Similar situations have arisen today. At times, peace among spiritual brothers has been disrupted because a failed business venture led to loss of money and perhaps to accusations of fraud. Some have taken their brothers to court, but God's own book helps us to see that it is better to suffer loss than to bring reproach on God's name or disturb the peace of the congregation. So, I mean, that is talking about business things, but the same kind of thinking permeates, um, you know, when it comes to even more serious um, crimes. I mean, imagine. I mean, how much more reproach is brought on the organisation by a crime like rape or murder, and child sexual abuse? Uh, that's worse than than stealing and fraud and things, isn't it? So, it's no wonder that witnesses would prefer not to get the secular authorities involved. Um, okay, so so we saw that. Brother Jackson's idea of spiritual help was to try and, uh, as he said, spiritually help the, the victim to become aware of their rights and the need. Um, because the need to report, I guess, because other children uh, may be at risk as well. Okay, now I better hurry up here. Uh, Angus says further, now if the circumstances is that the young person alleges they were abused by a member of the congregation but not a member of their own family and again you as an elder are persuaded, are totally persuaded that the person is telling the truth, what do you do then? The assumption behind it of course is that the alleged abuser is a risk to others, what do you do? And as I'm approaching the 15 minute mark again I'm going to have to do another part. <laughs> um, so. Come back for part, what are we up to, part five, um, to get the answer. Okay, bye.